Have you ever sat at a family dinner or around the fire with friends or wherever it might be and felt like everyone who was sitting there in that small circle of yours was talking about something different entirely? For me, it happens often at dinner time. We'll sit down and all want to go over the week calendar with the children and talk about what time karate is and who needs to get William from his piano lesson and all these sorts of things. And William will have a book in his face and he will raise his hand because he thinks he can't get in otherwise. And he'll say, did you know that when Homer wrote the Iliad and start talking about that and impatiently one of his sisters will be sitting over there ready to talk about what happened at school and they might start having an actual conversation for 30 seconds until William's hand goes up again and he wants to say something else about the Iliad. And by the time he has finished narrating the five pages of his graphic novel that he's been reading, the girls have lost interest in the conversation. Eric's doing the dishes, and we call it a night. <laughs> it's kind of what I think was happening to Jesus in today's gospel story. Today's gospel story actually picks up from the exact same conversation that we heard Reverend Jim preaching about last week when Jesus had been teaching his disciples what it means that in order to be a follower of Jesus, you must pick up your cross and follow him. But the disciples weren't paying any attention. They were talking amongst themselves in the corner until Jesus stopped talking long enough so that one of them could raise their hand and say, Jesus, who's the greatest among us? And Jesus responded, not by picking Peter or James or John, but by reaching out into the crowd of the other disciples, the other followers who had gathered around to hear Jesus' teaching. I imagine maybe these ones were actually listening to what he was saying. Um, and he picked up the smallest person, the little child, who even if she or he was listening, probably had no idea what Jesus was talking about. And he puts this little child in the center and he says this, is the greatest. This little child and those like this small person are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples are listening very attentively, nodding as Jesus finishes this grand point. And when he finishes, they pick right back up where they started again. They say, so we saw some people casting out demons in your name the other day. Now that must have burned. Because if we read through the gospel account, the disciples didn't always have the easiest time casting out demons in Jesus' name, even though he commissioned them to do exactly that. They cast out many demons, they healed many people, but there were times when they just couldn't do it. One story in particular catches my mind when Jesus tells his disciples this kind of demon requires prayer. Maybe the slowing down of themselves and their pretensions that the disciples just weren't quite ready for. But in any case, they say to Jesus, we saw some people casting out demons. I read in that, in the context of the conversation, we saw some folks trying to be great like us, but they aren't really, are they, Jesus? The little child is still sitting there in the middle of the conversation. I feel like Jesus looked at them like, where are you? What are we talking about here? But he answers them. He says, anyone who casts out a demon in my name cannot surely say anything evil about me. If they're not against us, then they're for us. Anyone who's giving out even a small cup of water. But now notice, he's not talking about demons. He's not talking about who's the best at doing all the important miracles. He says, anyone who gives even a small cup of water to one of these small ones, the child sitting in the center of the conversation still, anyone who even begins to help those who are the greatest, who are the most important in my kingdom, to them all reward will be given. I kind of feel... Like in this moment, the disciples are still engaged in that wink nod, you know, like the parents who say, we aren't keeping score at the peewee soccer game. 
yeah, of course, Jesus, we get it. You're saying we want to take care of these kids, but really, but Jesus doubles down. He says, in fact, anyone who puts a stumbling block even just a little stone to trip them on their path in front of, he's still talking about this little kid in front of him, in front of one of these small ones. For them it would be better that a great millstone would be tied around their neck. And then he gets into some of the most condemnatory, is that a word, condemnatory passages in all of Mark's gospel. He talks about the ways in which our own pretensions, our own greed, our own hubris, our own pride can push us to places where we turn against one another, where we turn against those who God has called us to serve. And when that happens, it would be better for us indeed if a great millstone were tied around our neck. At this point, I think the disciples are getting a little bit salty. (laughs) They're a little concerned about what's going on with all these other people who didn't do the due diligence, didn't follow Jesus all the way from Galilee, weren't sent out with nothing but the pack on their backs to preach the gospel. They might be sleeping in their comfortable homes. They're getting a little salty about Jesus preferencing these little children about Jesus saying that the good deeds performed those who hadn't gone in all the way were just as good as their good deeds. Mark tells it how it is a little bit more than some of the other gospel authors. Matthew and Luke, when they talk about salt, they say, you are the salt of the earth. Doesn't that feel good? (laughs) Salt of the earth. I don't really know what that means. Um, I read a whole bunch of commentaries about it, and I don't think the people who write those commentaries know what it means either. But doesn't it feel good? We are the salt of the earth. But Mark doesn't say that. In Mark, Jesus says to the disciples, to these salty individuals who are getting riled up over what, who's doing what and when and for whom, Jesus says there is salt in you. You have been salted by fire. I don't really know what that means either, but it does not sound as good. (laughs) I think, though, when I play around with this idea of what does it mean to be salty? What does it mean to get a little salty when you hear that somebody else is getting credit for the things you've worked really hard on? What does it mean to get a little more than salty When you hear somebody say that love is love, but then you hear that same person vote for politicians who want to make your love illegal. What does it mean to get a little more salty when you hear somebody attacking your family, your child, or your spouse, or your loved one? I confess I've gotten salty at times. Even in church, in my book, I tell the story, see I'm advertising my book, I don't often do that, but anyway, (laughs) thank you Reverend Jim for the opportunity. (laughs) In my book I tell the story about a moment where I encountered folks in church about this exact Bible passage. You see, looking back with about a decade or so um, hindsight, I, I can look at it neutrally and I can say that what was happening is there were some toddlers in church. Um, William, a decade, so William was a baby. But there were some toddlers in church, and there were some babies in church, and occasionally those toddlers and those babies were making noise. Um, And when they made noise, we took them out, (laughs) but that required walking down the aisle and going and taking the child out, or trying to shush them before things got too loud, and we had to walk out. Um, There were some adults in that same church, who felt that that noise was distracting to them when they heard the choir singing, that they wanted to be able to just quiet their hearts and their minds and attend to worship, or when they heard the reverend preaching and they wanted to be able to concentrate on the sermon. And so a couple of those adults, they got together and they wrote a letter. And in that letter, they quoted scripture. They said, Dear parents, 
would like for you to keep your children in the nursery the whole time because they're creating a hindrance for our ability to worship. They said, and remember, Jesus says that anyone who puts a stumbling block in front of one of the least of his disciples, around them it would be better that a millstone be tied around their neck. I got a little salty. <laughs> and I pointed out in words maybe that shouldn't have been used quite that way in church, or at least not in the pastor's office, um, that those little ones that Jesus was saying we shouldn't put a stumbling block around, they're not the 40 and 50-something old adults who are capable of minding their own attention and keeping their own distractions. They're the little children who are still trying to figure out, who is this Jesus guy? What does it mean to attend to and worship God? Trying to live into the mission God has called us. More than that, the little ones who Jesus tells us not to put a stumbling block, and Reverend Jim did a great job pointing this out for us last week, they're all those people who are pushed to the margins of our society, whoever and however that may be. So if we're in a place that is built for those of us who are able easily to walk in and out and move about, then what we need to do is make sure we make space in that place for those who don't have that same kind of able body. If we're in a space where it's easy for most of us to hear from this fabulous microphone and um, sound projection system, then we need to make sure that we don't make a stumbling block for those who may have a hearing impairment. If we're in a place where most of us are pretty tall, then we need to make space so that the smaller and the shorter ones among us can come forward and see what is happening at these key moments in the service. By the way, that's one of the things that kept me at Good Sam's really quickly right away when I came here. And I saw that the little children sit in the front so that they can see what's happening at the altar during the blessing of the Eucharist, the most important part of the service. There's all kinds of little ones in our midst. Not in a pejorative kind of, this person is smaller than me kind of way, but in a way that suggests there are those people in our midst who aren't worrying about who is the greatest, but are struggling to have enough to eat today, to have a dry place to sleep tonight, to have a fair shake at be being considered for a housing application or a job application. There are all kinds of little ones in our midst who Jesus is calling us to attend to. Certainly not to throw stumbling blocks in their way, but also to do our best to sweep those stumbling blocks out of their way whenever we can, because we who have the opportunity and the privilege to ponder and debate about who is the greatest have also the opportunity and the privilege to make more space in God. And don't think that's just the church. Because God's places are every place where the children of God abide. The whole of God's creation. And when we do that, we might get a little salty from time to time. We might start getting our hackles raised when we see somebody who's out there using the name of Christ in a way that doesn't promote love. Quoting scripture in a way that pushes down rather than lifts up those who God calls for us to care. And this is where perhaps Jesus' words about salt begin to make the most sense to me. He says, there's salt in you. Oh yeah, there is, Jesus. You've got that right. There's salt in you. I appreciate that Jesus recognizes that. And the salt isn't bad. The salt, in fact, may be that thing we need at times to raise us up so that we can be a voice for those on the margins. So that we 
Don't become discouraged and give up when we see people not casting out demons, but pushing new demons in Christ's name. There is salt in you, but Jesus says, be at peace with one another. That's the challenge, and I think the good news, all wrapped into one in today's gospel lesson. The encouragement that no matter how salty we may get and how justified we may be at times in that saltiness, God both loves us for who we are and how we are, and God loves that person who we want to call out and push out of the way. God loves that person who's casting out demons in Christ's name. God even loves that person who may be accidentally promoting a few demons in Christ's name. And God wants us to keep casting out the demons. God wants us to keep speaking for those who are the smallest, those who have been the most marginalized in our midst, and God wants us to find a way to be at peace each of us with one another. Because salt is good. But salt doesn't make the entirety of the recipe. God calls us to love as we have been loved. To care for those whom God puts before us without trying to pick and choose and interrupt God's great plan with our own ideas. Amen.